Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 John chapter 4. Finish out the year with this sermon. One of my favorites on the road preaching this message. 1 John, I'm getting there. That's why I had that marker on that page. 1 John chapter 4 at verse number 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I didn't say that real well. Propitiation. That's the mercy seat. He's where we meet with God to take care of our sins. The title of the message, The Love of God. I want to end this year with all of its confusion and all of it, both political, uh, economic, Pick their eight areas, by the way, in those lists. All of them, upside down. Even the church situation, uh, the spiritual end of it. There have just been so many things. I picked up the phone the other day, and one of my dearest friends, they were in the living room. I think they said they were. he was real sick. They were sharing verses and singing songs, and they turned around looking. Bob Dustman had gone home to be with the Lord. One of my preacher boys started out with me. I had uh, help in getting him in the first two churches that, that he pastored here in Colorado. One of my dearest friends, and he went home to be with the Lord. Just the day before that, I got a call from my friend Bob Tucker, Robert Tucker. We made five trips to Belize, Central America together. He made ten trips down there. Bought property, we built churches. And, well, we had a great time, and Linda texted me and said, uh, uh, Bob has COVID and he can't breathe. They're putting him in the hospital and a couple of days later, he went home to be the Lord. I was supposed to go do that funeral. I wanted so to go do that funeral, but with Joyce's health issues, I can't get out in a crowd with people we don't know and then come home. What she'd do is put me in a prophet's chamber for two weeks. And I don't want to go to the prophet's chamber. So I didn't do that funeral. But uh, every time I turn around, it's churches that are going through it and preachers that are going through it. There are churches opened across this country. You wouldn't believe it. Fundamental Baptist churches. And what's really strange, the list of pastors is as long as the list of churches. Nobody dealt to shuffle the cards. If they could put the two sides together, they could get an awful lot accomplished, but there's a lot of guys that are out of work. And I'm so thankful that you take care of your preacher. You pay our way, and we, we try to earn it. Joyce keeps me on my feet and keeps me on my toes. Uh, we, we'll make it through this. If we could pick up, uh, come on and get with me. Come on, give me a verse. If we could get through this on the one hand by bumping up the soul winning effort, and on the other hand, that we could pray that we could get some folks to become members of this body of Christ, because that's what we are. We're members of this local body of Christ. So be much in prayer about that. I want to finish it off with the fact that I know things are not good. I imagine my dear brother in evangelism, need you you make your living with meetings. And if churches can't have meetings, you 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 have to put your wife to work. And he's given her two jobs. No, I'm teasing he didn't do that. I don't think. He ducked his head, so maybe he did. And then evangelist sw switched from a church to the Philippines and can't go to the Philippines. And to be fair to him, he, he does uh, the computer. He teaches a bunch of churches, he, uh, training them because they have no education down there. And he's able to, well, I say that, they need the education, so he's doing that, but he can't go down there. You know, It's like that all around. Well, I, I'll tell you this, the thing that keeps you going is that we know that God loves us. Say amen. amen. Boy, if I didn't have that, I don't know what I would do. Uh, few people in this world really know the true love of God. The, the truth that comes of God's love is we can't do anything to earn it. You didn't do anything to get it. God gave it to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word world is cosmos. Mankind. God's love is first. And the love of God is what I want to preach on today. Uh, it requires nothing in exchange. We receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And what we automatically do with that is we love God back. 
Sometimes you're not as loving as you should be, but you can never change God's love for you. He's always the same with the way that he loves us. This is a topical message, and it's the five places in Scripture. I said five in Sunday school, and I had seven points. This one is really five. Five places in Scripture where we're told, by the way, what's the number five? Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Here's the grace of God that God loves you, shown to you five reasons why. Want to write the outline line down, turn your bulletin over, title the message, The Love of God. The reading text was 1 John 4.10. The first point is the sacrificial love. Write down John 3.16. Drop down to that second indent. It's not only a sacrificial love, it's an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31.3, an everlasting love. Then drop down to that third indent, put a three. It's immeasurable. It's an immeasurable love. Ephesians 3, verse 17 through 19. All of these explain what God's love is like. Number four, it's an unmitigated, not a word we would use a whole lot, but it's an unmitigated love, and that's in Hosea uh, 14 and verse 4. And then lastly, and certainly not least, it's a reciprocated love, and that's in Proverbs 8 and verse 17. Father, I love this message. I need this message today. It's so easy with the things around us and, and the failings and the, the, the trials. It's so easy to get our attention on ourselves and not on you. you. You never leave us nor forsake us is in one of these points. You, you never forget us. You know our every need. God, we need your love today. We need the understanding of it. You, you never, ever go away. It's always there. And the only thing that changes at all is whether we accept it and learn to live within the love that you provide. God bless this message, and I'll give thee praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn over to John 3.16. You know it by heart, but... Got some other areas around there. We'll stick with it. In John chapter 3 and verse number 16, I could take quite a bit of the text to go with that, but I won't. Uh, John 3, 16, I'll just get it in front of me here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you like a sub-outline, somewhere behind that in parenthesis, put down there, it's expressed by giving. The, the sacrificial love that God gave us is expressed by giving and you know it's the cal it's calvary when you're witnessing to a person i always stress this with folks that want to be soul winners uh, you start out with romans 310 all have sinned you know there's none righteous no not one pardon me 323 all uh, all of sin comes short of the glory of god but don't go anywhere until you've taken the rest of the verses behind that and show how great god is Somebody can say, yes, I'm a sinner. The next thing they need to see is how great God is. You have this well as illustrated in Isaiah chapter 11. In verse number 8, God said, whom shall I send and who will go for me? He could not have said that in verse 1. Why? Because in verse 1, Isaiah didn't have his eyes on the Lord. And there are three things that happened to Isaiah in those first verses before verse 8 that changed his life to where God could say, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And he would answer immediately, here am I, Lord, send me. And those three things are in that soul winning plan. First of all, he saw himself. He saw God high and lifted up, but that's what, that's your position in presenting the gospel. But the next thing he saw was, he had seen first was himself. Now in this case, it's second. He said, I'm, I'm, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a family of unclean lips. And all those things. And then, then could come the conviction. God sent the angel to put the coals on his lips. He got saved. And immediately God could say, whom shall I send? And he was ready to go. All of it because of what the position that God held. And that's what this is. It's expressed by the giving that God did. He gave his own son. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. And again, I'm back to apologizing for, for my new Bible. I lost my other one again. 
chapter 8, verse number 5, and I'm having trouble with the pages. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after spirit, the things of the spirit. God's sacrificial love puts us in a place where we can know God's love and his Holy Spirit will reveal those things to us through his word. And, that, and, it, and his love is expressed by giving. He gave his only begotten son. Have you looked at that lately? Jesus had to put up with what the Jews did to him, what mankind did to him, what the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees did to him. Well and good. What Pilate did to him, all of it ended up on the cross. And he looked up, and his own father had turned his back on him for the space of four hours. That's why the first thing he said on Calvary, hanging there, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's called a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is so obvious, it doesn't require an answer. My God, my God, why? Because he had on him the sins of the whole world. And Habakkuk said, uh, God being of pure eye cannot look on sin, will not regard iniquity. Jesus with our sin on him, God turned his back for the space of four hours. My God, my God. By the way, he answered that, the rhetorical question in verse 6. That's Psalm 22, 1. And in verse 6 he said, I'm a worm. The verb action there is I just now became a worm. And what's funny about the word worm, it's not a generic word of worm. It's a particular worm called tola. It's a little tiny white bug that Lydia, the seller of purple, would put in a bowl and mash up and squeeze off the juice. And she would only put the robes of royalty in that red liquid. And it's indelible. Once it was on the robe, it can never be removed. Jesus said, I'm a tola. I, he answered his own question. I'm dying on this cross. I'm the sacrifice that my Father is giving to you because he loves you, and I love you too. Jesus finally bowed down his head, and he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And he bowed down his head and gave up the ghost. Oh, you talk about expressed giving. It's manifested uh, there in, uh, uh, let's see where I want to look at that. First uh, John chapter 4, where I started, in verse number 10, uh, it said this, First John 4, 10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's first. Before he ever made Adam, God loved his mankind. For, uh, Psalm 140, 139, when you were in the womb, before you were even formed, you were fearfully and wonderfully being made, and God loved you in that womb. He loves you now. And that verse said here is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. He, he made uh, this clearly evident in manifesting his son. In Romans chapter 5, uh, I, think I might have read the wrong verse. Let me get back over there again. Romans chapter 5, when you get a sinner to the place that they can acknowledge their sin, you need, to, you need these verses. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. And much more now being justified by his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary. Did you ever see the fifth nail? The fifth nail on Calvary was put there by an angel. He stood under the cross. He stood there with the law, obviously in a condensed form, with a nail in it. And as the blood flowed out of Christ's body, when they pierced his heart, out flowed uh, red corpuscles and glucose. That's a coronary thrombosis. The heavy blood flows out first, then the sugar water. And that, that angel's down there put that nail up and began to drive it in. Colossians said uh, he, he took our sins, nailing it to his cross. That's the fifth nail. No one saw it but God. The angel drove it there, and the blood covered that law. And even though you're not a Jew and they lived the law, all of us have the law in our heart. And it's what we do that violates God's righteousness. And it was put under the blood. That angel held it. There's a tremendous illustration of the blood pouring down and covering that. Why did God do that? Because he loved us. 
to love us enough to sacrifice his own son. Can you imagine such a thing? Notice the second one, Jeremiah chapter 3. Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse number, uh, pardon me, Jeremiah 31, not 3. I'm going the wrong direction. Jeremiah 31 and verse number 3. The Lord hath appointed of old unto me, saying, uh, appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. It's not only a sacrificial love that is expressed by God giving. It's an everlasting love right below this in parenthesis that draws us to him. You need to get it through your head, friend. You didn't choose God. God chose you. And salvation is of the Lord. And it's in that first verse. God so loved that he gave. Under the conviction of sin, you can respond to that. But you're responding to that which was expressed God's everlasting love. And it drew you to him. Boy, I like that thought, don't you? Uh, a couple of things about this. The everlasting love that drew us toward him. John 14, 23. John 14 and verse 23. I'm getting there. Make sure I got my right verse. Yes, I do. Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The everlasting, the everlasting love draws us to him. You want to really find this? Go to the real Lord's Prayer. It's not John, uh, the, the Lord's Prayer. Now I lay me down, slave, not that one. Uh, uh, the prayer that you would pray, it's John 17. The whole chapter is the Lord's Prayer. Guess what it's all about? God loving his son, his son loving us, and his son introducing us to him. And all of us living together. That's all in John 7. That's the real Lord's Prayer. And he, I wish I had time to show you some of the things that are there. But here it is. Uh, in that verse, uh, we're drawn to him. We're kept by him. Every one of us. Uh, he makes our abode with us. John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself. It didn't stop at Calvary. When Jesus left the cross of Calvary, he spent this whole period of time setting up mansions in New Jerusalem where we'll one day be with the Lord. I always tease about our mansion has Joyce's name on the front door. I have to go around the back. It says, you enter here. That's what you get for being a preacher's wife. You get the front door and we get the back door. Oh, what a wonderful thing. It's expressed as an everlasting love. Romans 8.35. With this real quick. Romans chapter 8. I turned five pages and I went over two books. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Uh, chapter 8 and verse number 35. I'll get there in a minute. And verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I don't want to read them all, but shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Nay, in these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I'm persuaded, I love this, that neither death nor life nor angel nor principality nor power or things present or things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That everlasting love that God gave us draws us to him. It has a drawing effect. You know, you can tell that a lot by somebody that's made a profession, but they really don't have a possession. They'll give you a date that quick, but doesn't change their life. Nothing changes. Friend, the purpose of salvation is in your behavior and the word behavior is your manner of life. When you get saved, your life changes. If you claim to be saved and you don't love God's word, you don't want to talk to your heavenly father, here's a hard one, you don't even like God's preacher. <laughs> you, you don't even want to be a part of the church. Or better yet, put an asterisk by the one, 
or to go out and tell somebody else about Christ. I'd have a, I'd have a reason to say it. You need to check and see if you really got saved or if you just made a profession without a possession. If you really believed here instead of here. They call this one 18 inches from heaven. You go around all day from the center of your brain saying, I believe. Religions do it all across this country. But friend, till you can say, I believe, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. Everlasting love, it draws us to him. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And verse number 17 through 19, I'll take them all, I guess. But here you have, it's an immeasurable love. You can't, you can't put a ruler on it. He said, now let's see where I said I wanted to start. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted, underline it, and grounded in love. That's his message. That's God's love. That you be able to comprehend with all saints, now you read these and you tell me where you're standing to make these four measurements. What is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height? Where would you have to be to make those four? Here's the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. You would be right up there. Half the distance down, you'd be in the center of this room to make those four. And that's your position in Christ. You're placed in him. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might filled with all the fullness of God. What was the point? It's an immeasurable love. You can't, you can't just put your finger on it. Friend, it's eternal. It started before ever Adam was made. It started, what is it, five times, seven times in the Bible? We're told that that started before God ever made the earth. In eternity past, he'd already determined that if he made a man, that man would sin. And he would ne need to send his own son in the place of that man because only his son could die, come back to life, and ascend into the Godhead. Adam could never do that. And so when we die, we're in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Read Ephesians. Look how many times starting in Ephesians 1 about verse 8, you're in God's presence. Chapter 3, uh, twice in chapter chapter 3, in, in there, and it, it, every time you bow your head, you're in the presence of God. I used to have a dear friend I prayed with a lot. He's with the Lord now. My, we could, we could get close to heaven. And we'd be in my office, and I'll tell you the truth, we, we'd be praying. I could sense God's presence so good. I felt like if I opened one eye, I wouldn't be in my office. I don't want I'd I'd see the, the the throne room of God. I'd hear, I'd see God in there kneeling with us. God in there praying with us. And I'll tell you that old boy if you want to know it was Bill Boyer. He's with the Lord now. And boy, we could get so close to God and and just Lord it fill the room. The, here it is. It's immeasurable. You can't go any place it, it, and and it ends up that way. Now him unto him that is uh, verse 20, now in him to able to do exceedingly abundantly above. That measurement comes from the fact that you can't put a finger on God's love. It's everywhere present. And you live within that love. It's immeasurable. And by the way, the sacrificial love was expressed by giving. The everlasting love was expressed by drawing us to him. And the, measure, the immeasurable love is bestowed by God. Now it might have been Paul, who was giving those measurements. But the love that you have for God was given to you by God. You didn't think it up. You can't make it up. You can't build it or tear it down. God put his love in your heart. And there, listen to me. There has to be times when in your darkest hour or when the trial seems so great or, or when you've got so far from God you can't find him that you can get on your face before God and find that immeasurable love that's bestowed on you by God. And you can cry out, my Lord and my God. Oh, that was Paul's desire. He said, if he, uh, Philippians uh, 3.10, that I may know him. 
How do you want to know him? In the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his suffering, and be made conformable to his death. That was Paul's desire to know the Lord. Can you imagine? It's immeasurable. You can't put a ruler on it and try to uh, measure it somewhere. But you know what? It's totally understood by believers. The Bible says of this love, it passes understanding. You just know it's true. I, you know, and I, at times when I say this, I don't feel like a hypocrite, but I feel like I fall so short. I stand up here and tell you I know God loves me. I, I often wonder, if maybe one of the angels said, you want me to slap him now? <laughs> maybe even Jesus looks at his father and says, you slap him. <laughs> Why am I the only one laughing? Uh, you've been there. You let yourself get so down on yourself and you get down on you. You get down on God. You can't find him. You don't know where he is. Well, I'll tell you where he is. You're right there in the middle. And he's all around. The breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And you're right smack in the middle of that. It's an immeasurable love that God given us. Ah, but it gets better. Look at Hosea. Go back in the Old Testament and find Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. That's how I find Hosea. One of those four, Amos, Obadiah. There you go. Hosea, Joel, Amos. So I got to back up two books. Hosea, there he is. Uh, chapter 14 and verse number 4. I will heal their backsliding. Watch it. I will love them freely for my anger is turned away. It's an unmitigated love. The word unmitigated means not diminishing in intensity. One day God doesn't love you less than he did the day before. This is true in marriage. Now in our case, because of our old flesh, we can get in the flesh and kind of cloud that love between us. But the truth is when you get that flesh straightened out, it's there. It's a love God said of what he joined together, let no man put us under. What's the glue What's the stickum that holds that together? The love of God. It's unmitigated. It will never, God's love will never diminish to you. If you're not walking close to God right now, listen to me. It's not God's fault. God never changes. Look around. Find something in your life that's a barrier between you and God. Get rid of that thing and watch how the love of God will present itself to you. It's not diminishing in intensity. It's always the same. Here it is, John 15, 13. John 15, 13 says this. Greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. It becomes the type. God, God can't die. Jesus died physically. He's still God. And he gave his life. You, you talk about not diminishing. I, I get so mad when these guys, I had this in a sermon the other day. Oh, Jesus in the garden. And he said, Father, please don't make me go to Calvary. I, I don't want to die. But nevertheless, if, if you want me to die, I'll go. If you have a Savior that's that weak, you're not serving the Savior I serve. He wasn't talking about Calvary. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver so they could kill him suddenly. That's in Matthew. That means uh, quietly and with stealth. They came with spear and sword to take him into those olive trees, run the spear through his fifth rib, and leave a dead man laying on the ground. Jesus prayed so intently that God heard his prayer. The first two times he prayed, he sweat drops of blood. He said... You, you sleeping. Can you not pray with me for one hour? But the third time, the whole tone changes. He said, sleep on now. Take your rest. The hour's at hand. You know what he said? I got my prayer answered. I'm going to Calvary, and these dudes come and can't kill me. That's in the Riley version. And it reads a whole lot better than the other 407. These dudes can't kill me. So those dudes walked up. He said, whom seek ye? He'd already prayed. You find this in Psalm 17 or Psalm 17, 18. He said, Lord, uh, deliver thy darling. That's not Calvary. That's the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, God, I hear their footsteps. They've encircled me, cast them down. 
In Psalm 100, verse 40, he said, cast them down backwards. And God answered his prayer. He hadn't even gotten to wit to be with them yet. They're still coming through the garden. And he said to his disciples, sleep on now, take your rest. The hour's at hand. I'm going to Calvary. He said to them, uh, whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered that one word that he used later in front of the priest. He said, I may. That's the verb to be that means I am the eternal one. And the minute it said that, watch the next verse. This is John 18, 18. And immediately they fell down backwards. Why is that in your Bible? Because he prayed. He said, cast them down. And he had it to it. He said, cast them down backwards. And he was heard and he prayed. He prayed with great uh, affliction. He prayed earnestly and God heard him. God said, it's okay. They're not going to kill you here. You're going to Calvary. The Holy Spirit said, I'm taking a deep breath. <gasps> when Jesus said, I am, the Holy Spirit leaned over his shoulder and said, <laughs> all those soldiers fell down backwards, dropped their spears and swords. When they got up, he didn't run in. He said, whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. The word I may means eternal. And they said, you better come with us. That was never planned. I call it hot potato. He went seven places of hot potato. I don't want him. You, you, Herod said you can have him. Pilate said you can have him. The priest said you can have him. The high priest said you can have him. Finally, he ended up in front of Pilate again. Pilate fulfilled God's will, washed his head, and sent him to Calvary. Why? Because God loves you. Because God loves me. I, I, I don't want to put a human emotion on God, but don't tell me that didn't affect his father. Watching his own son go through all this stuff. You know, in order to be able to do that, it's called the decrees. Jesus gave up certain eternal parts of himself. He said, well, my father knows, but I don't. He gave up the ability to know everything that was happening to him. God the Father's watching that. He's watching him having to make these decisions. And all because God loves the likes of Judd Riley. Because God loves you. And he wanted Jesus to finish the task. And he gave it here with no diminishing of intensity. That's your fourth parenthesis. It was the same when he started. It was the same when he ended. You remember the story where the judge had the son come before him? I don't remember what it was there. It was a bad thing. It was his own son. And the law required that he give him 50 lashes, save one. You ever wonder why they saved one? They, they thought that the 50th lash would kill you. And his own son standing there and he gave him 50 lashes, save one. Then the judge got up and took off the robes and in his identity clothing walked down and said, I'll take the lashes for my son. I know Jesus went to Calvary, but you think that didn't bother God as much as it did his son because he knew he was doing it. And he wasn't going to change his mind. It's a, it was an unmitigated love. It was as great when he died as it was when God thought up the, the position of him giving his life, which was an eternity past. He loved you in the womb, and he loved you when you were born. He said to the one prophet, I called your name when you were in the womb. If you read the psalm, he counted every part of you when they were made. I wish he'd have been changed when he gave out noses he'd give me yours and not mine but you know how that is you got some parts on you you wish he'd given different but you got everything just the way he wanted you to have it here's the last one look at proverbs chapter 8 and verse 17 proverbs 8 and verse number 17 did you get them the sacrificial love john 3 16 expressed by giving god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm almost there. Chapter 8. The everlasting love. That's what draws us to him. I didn't ask to get saved. Man, I wasn't about to, to make a profession. Four times Ed Nelson said, will you do that? I said, no. The last time he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. He said to Glenn Jaspers, let's leave. They got to the door and I heard that verse. I'm supposed to put God first and just trust him. I said, Doc, would you come back? I'd like to get saved. What would have happened if I let him walk out that door? 
Well, I think in my case, God would have sent somebody else. <laughs> but that could have been the last chance old Judd Riley would have ever had. It's immeasurable. I know how much God, unmitigated, never, never diminishing in intensity. But I like this one the most. Proverbs 8 and verse number 17. I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. The first part, this is reciprocated love. I love him, I love them that love me. You love me, I love you. I love you, you love me. Here it is, reciprocated. This is giving back for what you get. God loved us, now let's give back. We give that love to someone else. First, give it to him. Don't hesitate to be one who's willing to say to God, I love you. Separate it. I love you, my Father. Jesus, I love you. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for living in me and taking that those four places in John 15 through 17 that Christ has, and you took those four places, and you're my daily friend. That's your Holy Spirit. You got all three of them here. It's a reciprocating love. You love him. He loves you. Sure as you shut your eyes to that love, you won't experience the love that he has for you. If God had turned his back on his own son for having your sin, do you think God's going to smile at you if you don't confess your sin? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us all in righteousness. What if we don't? Then he won't. Save, sure. Once saved, always saved. But you want to live a miserable life? Profess that you're saved and let sin rule your life and watch the misery that you're going to... God's not going to let you enjoy that. If you're truly saved, you say, well, that's funny. Man, I, I said I'm saved, but I do all those things not to happen. Duh. Don't you think maybe it would be time to double check and make sure that you really got saved? Th these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you could guess at it. Who was that verse written to? These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You're, you're sitting here today in a reciprocal position. It's your turn today to say to God, I love you because I will guarantee you, if you are truly saved, he said it to you every day. Have you been listening? He said it to you every day. Have you been listening? Did you demonstrate your listening by changing your pattern of life, your behavior is called in scripture. Your conversation is what it's called. It means your manner of life. And somebody looks at you and say, you know, you're different than you used to be. That's your conversation. That's your manner of life. Now God said, you exalt me and I'll exalt you. Now one day the exaltation is gonna come at what's called the beam of bar judgment. You'll stand before him and you'll be judged. Isn't that awful? For the good and the bad. The bad is never sin. Sin is under the blood. The bad is what that sin did in stealing your rewards. The purpose of the beam of bar is joy. You gave five, you got ten back. You did this and you got all that back. But if you're standing there and there's nothing for you to receive, how tragic that would be. Saved? Yeah, the Bible says, saved so is by fire, having no reward. I preach a message entitled, Going to Heaven Smelling Like Hell. That's people who profess to be saved and just flip God off. I'll go when I want. I'll read if I want. I'll pray maybe. Uh, but I'm going to live my life. Friend, it's reciprocating. God said to you, have a good time because you're going to do it without my help. I don't know about you, but I need God's help every day. <laughs> and the older I get, uh, the more I need his help. Oh, what's up? Uh, Precious things. One last verse. First John four nineteen. Now I'll quit. First John four nineteen. I'm going to quit with the cute illustration here in a minute. Acts chapter. What did I say? John. <laughs> where am I at? I lost my verse. John four nineteen. Okay, that's six. There we are. John four nineteen. And verse number nineteen. I'm getting there. Uh, whoops! I got something wrong here. Let me see what I did wrong. First uh, John four nineteen. I wonder why that looked like that. First John four nineteen. Back to the love chapter. We love him. Here's reciprocal, because he first loved us. God said, "Well, I love you because you're loving me." 
Well, I'm loving you because you're loving me. It's, it's reciprocal. It goes back and forth. True love is that he loved the unlovely. That's what you were when you got saved. This true love, he saved you because you were needy. Sin had separated you from God and from eternity. And the true love is when you got saved, you became one of his own. To us, you became one of the brethren or the cistern, if you can use that word. We became part of the family. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. That's your true relationship with God. Don't wait till then. Live it now. Love God today and up your love with God today. Confess your sin. Get your heart right. Commit yourself to him and watch how much he will do for you. Walk away. Spit in his face, so to speak, but you never do that. But let this go by and watch what he won't do for you. Watch what he don't for you. I could put the negative on that. Watch the things he'll take away because you didn't do these things. I close with this illustration. There was a man who lived in a, a rural community. And it was a real friendly community. Farmers' communities are. We used to get together when I lived with my uncle. We'd all harvest together and use the same machines. And the ladies would bring out a big old harvest lunch. And man, we'd have the greatest time. But there was one farmer there. He would never get involved in any of it. He said, I don't need it. I got my wife and my daughter. I don't need anything else. Boy, and people look at him. They'd invite him. I don't want to come. But one day he was out in the field to see if the grain was ready. You go out on a high hill and you take that uh, little piece of that grain and you, I've lost so much germ, and you rub it in your hand like that, you chafe it. You blow off the chaff, and now you got the grain. You throw it in your mouth. I could never do this. All I got was a, a gob of junk that was running out my mouth. My uncle could do that. He'd roll it, put it in his mouth. No, it needs a couple more weeks. Okay. And, and then finally one day he said, it's ready. And we'd get the machines and come and harvest the grain. Well, this man went out in the field to check it, he and his wife and little girl. He's busy and intent going to the top of the hills, rubbing a few and talking to his wife. And he said, uh, uh, it's, it's very near ready. Get your daughter and let's go. She said, I thought she was with you. And they turned and looked and no little girl. This is a thousand acre wheat field or however big, huge wheat field. And wheat fields have the high places. A lot of times the low places have the water in them, the stale water that's down there, they could not find that little girl. One of the farmers drove by and saw it. He saw him frantic. He said to him, what, what's wrong? The guy said, our little girl's missing. He said, well, let me, let me get the townspeople. He said, we'll take care of our own. And then his wife went to, the guy said, no, you won't. He ran to town. They rang the bell. All the farmers came. Their wives came. Their kids came. They lined up hand to hand. Forget the wheat. They started marching through that field. The guy and his wife were still frantic. And all of a sudden down the line, they heard someone say, we found her. Everybody ran that way and the man and his wife, others got there and it was death quiet. And the man knew. He stepped through the crowd. There was a man in the water up over his knees holding a little girl and she was dead. And the man looked at all the other folks had their heads down, men were holding their hats. The guy held the little girl out to the man and the man was heard to say this. Oh, oh, if only I had joined hands earlier. He wouldn't even take the hands of the others. I do it myself. That sound like you? Well, I have news for you. One of those hands you'll hold to be God. And God won't let you go astray. God won't lead you somewhere you don't need to be. He'll reciprocate. He'll give you the love of God that passes understanding. He'll make your life count for Him. What a joy it'll be. And every now and then, especially facing a new year, especially coming out of 2020, if you don't do anything else this week, prepare yourself for the next year. Because there's no telling what's going to be coming. If you're a little separated, a little nothing, if, if you've gotten yourself off and away from these things, knowing the sacrificial love, the everlasting love, the immeasurable love, 
the unmitigated love, and mostly the reciprocated love. Do it now. We don't get much with invitations anymore, so I'll give this invitation with you standing where you are in just a moment. Where you are, you bow your head, and you determine where the love of God is in your heart and what God is doing in your life. And then you look a good look at yourself to see if you're loving him back the way he loves you. And if you're not, it's the simplest thing in the world. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive. He's not going to give you a work list. He's not going to get a whip out. God's going to forgive you, and he'll put his arms around you, and you'll be closer to him. You can face more of what's coming on. Who knows, if you do that, you may even come up with a good slogan for me for this next year. Don't forget the two, that we can see folks saved and families added to our church. Father, I love you today, and I know I'm probably not the best example to be up here. This has been a tough year for me. It's been a tough year for our church, and, and I think of some of the things I've thought, some of the things I've done, and the discouragement that's filled my heart, the, the sorrow that comes when other brothers have passed on, and they're with you, and their families are left alone, and, and so much of it's happened around us. Good churches closing all around us. God, I, if I ever needed to love you more, I need to do it right now. And I pray, Lord, you'll help me to love you because I have no doubt in my mind you will reciprocate and your love will be manifested in my life. I pray the same for these dear folks that are here. You know our hearts. Don't have a piano to play an invitation. But Lord, search our hearts and give us a moment in prayer to examine ourselves before thee. Standing together, please, and our heads bowed for just a few minutes. You say to God what you may to say. And I'll close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your son, for the price he paid on Calvary. I seem to be more mindful today of my need to love the Holy Spirit who dwells within his spirit bearing witness with my spirit, with these folks' spirit. First of all, that we are the sons of God. Secondly, that we can be led. He can guide us and direct us. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, I pray to have a better relationship and being an obedient servant in this year to come. Bless me with the word. Bless my prayer life. Bless our family life. Bless our church. God, I'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.